This episode of Revision Path is brought to you by Facebook Design. Facebook Design invests in building and teaching designers using the best tools for the job. I asked product designer Carla Cole what she's learned about design since working at Facebook. I, in my six months at Facebook, <laughs> I have learned to ask lots of questions. A lot of things are, there. there's so much to learn and there's a lot of intel that is in a lot of people's heads. Learn more at facebook.com forward slash design. Are you looking for a job? Do you know someone who's looking for a job? Then check out our job board over at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. Whether you want a full-time job or you're looking for something temporary or freelance, we've got you covered. This week, the New York Times is looking for a freelance product designer. We also have job listings from indeed.com, so head to the Revision Path job board at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to apply and to search for any other listings. Don't forget to sign up for weekly job alerts so when there are new positions added to the job board, you'll get an email so you can be the first to apply. And if you're looking for more jobs, then become a member of our Slack community and join the jobs channel. See you there. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to the Revision Path Podcast. My name is Maurice Cherry, and before we get into this week's interview, I just have three quick announcements. First up, Revision Path is currently featured on iTunes. If you go to the iTunes app or you go to the podcast app, you should see an image there that says the Black Experience. Click or tap on that and you'll see our show featured in the perspectives and interviews section. There's a bunch of really, really super great podcasts. If you've been looking for black podcasts, that's the place to go. Huge thanks to Apple for that. It's a huge honor just to be included with that many shows. And thanks to Barry of Podcast in Color. That's her influence at work. So if you're looking for even more black podcasts, make sure you check her out. Secondly, don't forget to check out 28 Days of the Web. That's our sister site where we showcase a different black designer in February in conjunction with and in celebration of Black History Month. This is our fourth year running 28 Days of the Web, and we're coming up on recognizing over 100 people there, which is a huge milestone. Make sure you check out the site that's 28daysoftheweb.com, or you can follow Revision Path on Instagram or Facebook for daily updates. And lastly, we're putting together a special episode this month to commemorate our fourth anniversary, and I want you to be a part of it. Stay tuned to the end of the episode for more details. Now let's talk about our sponsors, MailChimp and Hover. Join more than 15 million people who use MailChimp to not only send email newsletters, but to grow their businesses on their own terms. Start sending professional looking newsletters to your clients today for free. Sign up at MailChimp.com. Every great idea deserves a great domain name, and that's where Hover comes in. Choose your domain from the hundreds of extensions out there and start building that new project that you've been waiting on today. Right now, you can get a .design domain for only $19.99 a year. That's half off the regular price. Use our promo code REVISIONPATH and save an additional 10% off your purchase. Here's our Patreon fundraising campaign update. So we're at a new record high of 43 patrons for a new total of $272 per month. A big thanks to all of you who have pledged your support and your appreciation for the show. If you enjoy what we're doing here at Revision Path, if you enjoy any of the guests that we've had on the show, anything that we've talked about, if you've gotten any kind of value from listening, please consider becoming a patron. You'll get great perks like early access to future episodes, access to our special patrons only podcast, and free Revision Path goodies. Just head on over to patreon.com forward slash revision path and make that happen. Pledge levels start at just $1 per month and it's a great and affordable way to support the show on a regular basis. Now for this week's interview. I'm talking with graphic designer, design educator, and brand consultant Ron Tinsley. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. 
My name is Ron Tinsley. I am a brand consultant. I'm a graphic designer. I'm an educator. I am the founder and owner of Prophetic Soul Branding and Design. It is a three, four-year-old branding agency where we specifically work with mainly nonprofits and educational institutions doing branding and rebranding and also smaller projects as well. And I'm based in Philadelphia, greater Philadelphia area. And most of my clients are in this area, but I have a few that are also around the nation. So you say you started about three or four years ago. What was the inspiration behind you starting? Part of the reason why I started was because uh, the full-time job I was at, it was a school merging with another school. And I had been the communications director there. I was also teaching and I had been there for seven years, feeling like I had run my course. Mm -hmm. And I actually wasn't sure I was coming back into design. I was you know, come to where I was at, but I started realizing how much I missed, missed it. So I just started talking to different people and realizing that my network actually was locating work for me. And so I went out on my own. Uh, once again, I did it earlier in my career and set up a website and all of that. And here we are now a couple of years later and my business is growing. Now the types of clients you say you mostly work with are nonprofits, those kind of businesses. How do you approach a new project? Say a prospective client is listening and they want to contact you for work or anything. How do you approach a new project? Like what's your creative process? Are you talking about like, how do I get the work or after I get the work, how do I approach? After, after you get the work, like okay. you've already talked to the client, they're ready to go. How do you approach a new project? Okay. Well, you know, I've learned through trial and error uh, how to do that. I mean, you know, Managing a design process is also about managing people, managing the client that you're working with. And the bigger the client is, the more people you have to manage. So I've learned that managing them is a big piece of it along with the design process. So what I do is I keep them connected to every part of the process. Now, I don't necessarily let them speak into every part, but I let them know what's going on and I educate them because, you know, everybody thinks they know about design and some people really do. Some people have an intuitive sense for it, but some people don't. So what I do is as I'm working on it, I'm keeping them abreast of what's going on. Now, it depends on what kind of project it is. If it involves research, basically, you know, they just give me access to their files and I start setting up some other things that I work on that. And then I present a creative brief. If that's not involved and they just want me to just put something together, then basically I still ask those questions about who is your audience who are you trying to reach? And I give an assessment before I do anything, because one of the things I'm careful about is I don't want to have a client doing something that's not necessary. You know, I don't want them to rebrand if it's not necessary. I don't want them. Sometimes they're veering right when they should veer left. And so I give that I give them that perspective. And sometimes they don't like it, you know, and sometimes <laughs> They do. And when they don't like it, then I generally will end up saying, hey, I'm I mean, I don't think I'm the designer for you. But if they do like it, what I find is that they become long term clients because then they appreciate the fact that I took the risk to tell them that. So as I'm developing whatever it is, I'm developing the design. Once I start presenting concepts and things like that, you know, I give them background on why I chose to go in this particular direction, you know, and some and I don't give them add infinitum choices. I give them, I mean, limit them to two or three choices, depending on what the project is and say, what's your feedback? They can say they hate it. And I can go back to drawing board if the contract specifies that. But oftentimes it's choose one, choose a direction, and then I'll work on it some more. And I found great success with that. And usually from there, like you said, those clients end up becoming longer term clients because you're including them in that process, you know, every step of the way. Right. I'm also what they appreciate about that is what you just said, Maurice. And also I'm being truthful with them, mm -hmm. you know, inside of advertising, graphic design and whatever, especially advertising, there's always this veneer of, I want to say deception, but you know, <laughs> you, you push the boundaries of what's true and what's not, you know, with advertising, you suggest certain things or whatever. And that is part of what some people do. I try to stay away from that. There are clients who've requested that I say things that weren't true and I flat out told them, but that's not true. And if, you, if your audience finds out, you know, you can be a deep water. 
And if they consistently pushed, I just would say, you know, I this isn't going to work. And part of that is just, I believe in being ethical. I don't want to look back on work and go, wow, those people really fell for that. Mm. You know, I don't want to be that guy. I mean, and I think there are a lot of clients out there who want that. But there are some that really, they like win at all costs. And, yeah. and that I'm careful about. How would you describe your your personal design style? Like when you're working with clients, do you sort of try to bring your own flair to it? Or are you more so trying to just achieve what their business goals might be? That's a difficult one. I didn't mention this earlier, but I also wear the hat of artists. And okay. I'm, I'm one of those graphic designers where I've also learned a lot about art theory, art criticism. And so... I cross both those boundaries to find ideas. You know, like I'll give you an example. I did research on Art Nouveau movement for a particular client because of the the direction that the logo was going in. I ended up finishing it and they were happy with it. And mm-hmm. so, you know, it's one of those kind of things where, you know, I got to keep this balance. So with that and also the Swiss style of design, I can't get away from that. That's part of the design methodology I learned. So I do spend a fair bit of time listening to my clients, but I do tend to move more with a minimalist approach in my work, trying to make sure that their message is getting through. And that, again, comes from that Swiss style of methodology. And so I I have a tendency to combine all of these things. Clients that look for me look do look at my style. There's a very graphic aspect to what I do. The use of juxtaposing of images, whether they're photos, whether it's color, blocks of color, you know, it's pretty obvious in my work. So generally people who look for me are looking for that, you know, and if they're not looking for that and they want something a little different, it's not that I can't do it. I just got to hear them out more, make sure I understand what they're looking for. And either I will try to give them what they're looking for or I'll recommend someone else. Walk me through a a typical day. Like, what's it like working in your studio? Well, a typical day first is looking around at my studio and just thanking God I have space to have one at home. That's number (laughs) one. (laughs) I'm just happy to be able to. I like working from home because none of my kids are here during the day. The only thing I got to deal with is my dog and he just sleeps half the time (laughs) or whatever. So the first part of my day comes down to, of course, um, checking emails and if i'm in the middle of a project sometimes it's more urgent than that usually i i I make a to-do list for the day and as things goes on sometimes i get away from that but it help if i got a lot of things to do that helps me to make sure i'm completing things but often the first thing i'm doing oftentimes is communicating with people through email or through video conferencing i'm either updating them on a project or i'm trying to figure out where a project is at the other side of that is if I was to break down my day in percentages, I would say that 50% of my day is spent, 40% is spent responding to, to people and catching up with clients and making sure projects are on point. I would say another 40% is spent brainstorming, designing, researching. I put all of that in the same boat. And another 20% is actually spent on what I would just call education, where I actually am reading something, whether it's books I have out of the library, books I have at home, the internet, where I'm reading about graphic design, I'm reading about anthropology, I'm reading about sociology, psychology, all these other things that that basically impact what I do for clients and give me my edge, to be honest with you. So, and then some days that, that percentage will change, you know, but the other side of that is when you work for yourself, you tend to work long hours. Mm-hmm. So my day could be from eight to 10 hours as I'm going about it. And sometimes it's shorter than that too. I don't tell my clients that, but <laughs> but some, some days I'm working six hours and I'm like, I'm good. I'm going to go, I'm going to go to the cafe and, or I'm going to go catch up one of my kids or go catch up with my wife and eat lunch or something like that. So right now I'm in a busy period because I've taken on more work and I have long-term contracts. So, so I got to be careful with that. So. Yeah, I found it easier. You know, I've been in business now myself for a little over eight years and my days are never really, I wouldn't say they're not really the same, but yeah, some days are certainly more productive. You get more stuff done. Other days you're like, you know what? I'm just going to take off at noon and 
to spend right. the rest of the day doing something else. I mean, you have the luxury and the freedom to do that when you have your own business. But also, I think just in terms of switching up the routine, it, yeah. it kind of helps keep your, your creative muscle strong so you don't get burned out by just work, work, work. Because trust me, I know the struggle of work, especially working from home. You can just right. keep working and working and working and working. <laughs> <laughs> and you can also get, yeah, you're right. You can get a little claustrophobic, get tunnel vision, especially when it gets where I live at. When it gets cold, yeah. when it goes from, let's say, fall to winter, I got to brace myself because I'll be honest with you, some in the summertime, I will sit on my porch with my laptop and work mm -hmm. and, and just say hi to people as they walk by. Sometimes I'll stop and talk to folk. And it's nice. But then when it gets a little, when it gets warmer, I mean, when it gets colder, people go in the house. I got to go in the house. Yeah. And I purposely start scheduling times to connect with people, you know, through lunch or even beyond that, you know, uh, it can be even just coffee with someone meeting with someone and not just even for me to get anything out of it. Sometimes I'm meeting with people to encourage them in some kind of way with it. And I'm not even talking about just designers. I'm talking about friends I have. And so, you know, that's one of the benefits that I enjoy about it is that I don't, I don't separate all of that from who I am as a designer. I, you know, clients get all of that. So inspiration can hit like lightning sometimes. And sometimes it may take a five day sleepless process, you know, to get through work. And I appreciate that because I like that variety. And it keeps me also from getting too insular, too. It's that's one thing that when you work for yourself, you got to be really careful about. Speaking of that, uh, you you know you kind of mentioned inspiration. What does inspire you? I know you say you do a lot of research, and that helps you when it comes to design. But in general, like if you're having an off day or something like that, what kind of stokes that creative fire for you? Well, I'll tell you something that's interesting to me that I always felt like in design school they didn't put a lot of emphasis on. Well, some of my teachers did. Sometimes I'll go sit out on my porch. And just or go somewhere, if not on my porch, go somewhere and people watch, not not obviously like stalking people, but somewhere <laughs> outside where I can just kind of feel the flow of life go by. I'm more interested in everyday people and how people do things and go throughout their day. I've learned a long time ago that that's where I get most of my inspiration from. And that's why when I was in college. I took a class in sociology and I lit up. I hated most of my humanities classes, but sociology, for some reason, it just gripped me. And what I realized is that when I was younger, as a, I realized now I was, I'm an introvert, watching people is what introverts do so that they know how to react to them. And so I will get inspiration from just simply watching people and discerning things about people in details. And I'll take notes about what I see. I also get inspiration from listening to my children and listening to people, listening to people talk about their lives and how they go about their day and what motivates them and what doesn't. And I think that gives me an edge as a designer because some of that stuff is intuitive. Some of it is data driven, mm -hmm. but some of, you know, quant, quant, what do they call it? Quantitative, but some of it is qualitative data that you can just glean from listening to people. And I'm not the kind of person that I'll go to museums, but I'm not that dude. I'm not that dude that goes to museums to get inspiration. I, I know what's there, but I'm more interested in, in what I would call living art, which is more like folk art and things like that nature. So I tend to focus on what the living are doing. I still know the history of what those other folks did, but what the living doing is a lot more challenging to me and a lot more fascinating and interesting. And I carry a sketchbook with me everywhere I go, whether I try to visualize what I'm seeing or whether I just take notes with what I'm seeing. So and I make sure I don't let I don't let I don't let anybody touch my sketchbooks. <laughs> I mean, that's just I have sketchbooks from 20 years ago and I still will go back wow. and look in them and draw ideas for clients today that have never been used. Not all the time. Or I'll, I'll draw an idea that it'll spark something. It might not be the exact idea. So I believe that ideas are recyclable, not necessarily ideas you've already used, but things that you've come up with that may have never seen the light of day. So in that sense, that's the artistic side of me as well. Now, you're originally from Philly. You 
grew up there, born and raised, went to school there and everything. Tell me what you love about the city. Philly cheesesteaks is number <laughs> one. Uh, it might kill you in the long run, but they're good. I mean, you know, they have tons of grease in them. That's why I say that. Philly cheesesteaks. I like Philly also. I like his working class spirit. People here are scrappy and really are one to work hard to get from A to B, especially the kind of folks that I grew up with. I mean, there are folks that don't, but there are a lot of folks like that, and that inspires me. And that, and, and in that sense, that working class spirit means no holds barred. People will speak the truth, you know, to you, mm -hmm. even when you don't ask for it. And it's that kind of truth that I'm trying to see when I'm observing people. I'm trying to find when I'm looking at what's important to people. So, and also, you know, my family's here as well. My both side, my wife's side of the family, my family is here as well. And I appreciate the fact that Philly has a great deal of history. The whole Declaration of Independence and Independence Hall. I mean, I'm bored with that stuff at this point in my life because I've seen it like billions of times. Mm -hmm. But I, I understand how other people from other parts of the world, other parts of the country come here and go, wow, this was the birthplace a country and I can appreciate that even though when I was going through school they take you to see that stuff every year so when people say hey so you want to see the Liberty Bell I go no it's, <laughs> it's downtown I know where it's at you yeah. know it ain't going to where it's a crack in it it's cool you know <laughs> so I've left Philly several times actually in my career I left twice and I came back twice so and I I love New York but New York is a little overwhelming to me it's a nice place to visit my son is up there now in college but i could probably live there but i wouldn't want to <laughs> let's just put it that way so I, I like the urban working class cities like philly cleveland uh detroit you know those kind of places they remind me and even chicago they remind me a lot of philadelphia in some ways do you find that that spirit that you talked about extends over into the design community there? You mean in Philadelphia? Yeah. Um, I'll be honest with you. I have a hard time answering that because I don't move in design circles. I'm not a member of AIGA. I don't necessarily go to events and things like that. And part of the reason for that, I, I might need to think about, I have been rethinking that, to be honest with you. But part of that and the reason is in the past is that there was a lot of pretentiousness that my working class roots just couldn't deal with, <laughs> to be honest with you. Okay. It was, I just didn't, the elitism, I couldn't grasp because I would have felt like a hypocrite. You know, I'm coming from a poor background. I got an education now. Now I'm a designer and I'm all highfalutin and bourgeois and, and those people are not like us. I can't embrace that. I would be betraying my roots if I did that. And I'm not saying every designer is like that, but that was pretty strong. I, I didn't like that vibe. And so I kind of moved away from that and just started really either connecting with designers as individuals, artists, or just hanging out with regular people. Because what I realized is that a lot of regular people have artistic yearnings. They just never got a chance to express them. Yeah. And I found soulless there you know so i don't know how i, I think things may have changed because it's been like close to 20 years but sometimes when i'm looking at stuff on the internet i'm just like mm, i don't know if they were moving fast enough i'm glad to see some people that i don't know in very prominent places speaking about these things and i'll give them credit for that and i'm not saying they shouldn't do that but i'm still kind of feeling like I want to give my time to young designers of color because when I do meet them, they go, where are you guys? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the main question I get when I bump into them. Where are you? Like, why aren't you in AIGA? And I'm not trying to bias them against AIGA. I guess they have a purpose to serve. But I'm at a point where I feel like they need me more than I need them. Mm -hmm. You know, at this point in time in history, 20 years ago, it may have been flipped. But okay. now, I, so I'm not saying I won't get connected, but so I, I could say, honestly, I, I don't know. That's a, a very fair assessment. I think a lot of designers of color, particularly black designers, probably feel the same sort of way. 
like they would get involved maybe in a, a design organization like a AIJ or something, but there's there's a level to it that puts them off, and that level is sometimes you know like you said there's a, that pretension that might be there when really you're all you know practitioners of this craft, right. and you don't know why that that has to be there in order for people to kind of work together. And you know I know you talk about AIJ. AIJ is not the only you know design organization out there, but True. There was, is, I guess it's still active, I don't really know, but there was at one point in time the Organization of Black Designers, which was out yeah, of I remember D.C. That. I don't know if they're active now or as active as they were. I know they've had some, a lot of personnel changes and, and things have shifted, so I'm not really sure what the state of that organization is. But let's say you were to design or to, to be in a design organization or create your own, what would you want to see out of that? Well, it's a good question. One of the things that interests me is youth, minority youth and young people. Part of the reason why I'm careful about my involvement in in any organization is I don't want it to take me away from help, trying to help minority youth. And I've found in the past that when I've gotten involved, folks will say, come speak here, come speak here, come speak there. And I'm I'm often preaching to the choir. It may be lucrative. You might get paid for, but it was taking me away from working with young people. And so in that respect, I would like to see more interest in in having design be understood at the high school level, let's say. Everybody's about STEAM and STEM right now, which is great. Mm -hmm. But design has a place in all of that that I think is getting neglected. So I don't want to just go and just sit and hear a lecture from a designer, which is great stuff. And you can increase your knowledge and all of that interested also in more being proactive in helping poor minority youth see if design is a viable profession for them. Number two, even if they don't choose design, understanding how they can use some of its principles in their life. And so in that sense, I'm more interested in, in that. And so if an organization came to me and said, we're interested in this, you know, I might be willing to, you know, have some conversations with, and I have worked with organizations that have. But what I'm think I'm I'm still cautious about is it's this fine line between tokenism and getting done what I feel like I'm supposed to be doing. I don't want to be put in a situation where I need to be spending my time educating these folks. I mean, my whole thing is read a book, read a book, you know, mm -hmm. pick up a book somewhere. And if and so I've stopped trying to do that kind of education with people. I'll say. Go pick up this book and that book and read it. You know, so someone asks me about something, I'll say, read the autobiography of Malcolm X. What does that got to do about design? Read it. <laughs> <laughs> so you can understand how this group of people feels when you're talking about trying to impact them with, with your design. You know, so, so that's one aspect. And another aspect is I would love to see the way they do events. I would love to see an urban or sensibility because so much of African-American culture is American culture. Okay. And I don't think that the larger mainstream culture always acknowledges that they're so accustomed to coming in and borrowing and taking. And in some cases you don't need, the origins aren't even always acknowledged. So I would love to see like an African-American event planner do an AIGA event to attract designers of color. Mm -hmm. And not just simply have some classical music playing with some carrots and some lettuce. I mean, that's all fine and good <laughs> and cool and all. But but I would love to see see us put. And, and here's the thing with reason why I'm saying that, because that event, I guarantee you, if it's done right by that person, wouldn't just attract African-Americans because we all know that other groups are interested in African-American culture and the way we do things. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, I mean, it can be done to attract a variety of people. But what, I, what I'm saying is I would love to see that. And when I look around and I've been to the events over the years, I don't have nothing against classical music and popular music and stuff like that. But <laughs> I'm used to being the minority and I would love for them to be in a situation where they're a minority. And, and I've had it happen to some of my white friends. Man, I felt so uncomfortable. And welcome to my, my world. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's regular for me. <laughs> And have our talent and creativity have its impact on that. And I would love to see that because I guarantee you if they did something like that, 
they may see more of us want to get connected or at least start going, hmm, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and not in a tokenism kind of way, not in a let's do this one time and see what happens. But I think they might see, and, and I'm not even saying what that should look like. You know, I'm in my 40s. That sensibility might have to be more like what's people in their 20s. I'm okay with that. You know, it doesn't have to be exactly what I would respond to. But I'm still looking at, okay, where are the way we think and the way we talk is included in what you're trying to do? That's the question that I would ask. And there's enough black creators out here that I think that that's possible. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even what you just mentioned, that kind of falls in line what i'm doing with revision path like i'm showing people that this is an option well not i won't say an option i'm showing people that these folks exist and mm -hmm. don't get me wrong since i've started the show i certainly have encountered non-black designers that have told me that they wish they could get into the show but it's just so many black people or it's just so many uh, yeah that well basically that's what it boils down to they're saying it's so many black people and i'm like well that's that's the focus of the show. I'm a black designer. Right. I'm talking to other black <laughs> designers. So that's what I'm, I'm showcasing, you know, and every now and then, you know, someone will say, well, I'm, I'm a white designer. Does that mean I can't be on the show? I'm like, well, yeah. I don't understand why you would ask that question knowing what the focus is about in the first place. Right. And, you that, know? and that's, and that right there is, that's where the tension is at. And I'll give you credit, Marty's for standing on that because that's where I often find the tension is, 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 is I give this example in a presentation where I tell people about how rap evolved. And I always say to them, when rap first started, it was, con or hip hop, whatever you want to call it, was called, it was considered African-American music. Mm -hmm. But somewhere in the early 90s, and I remember that people had no problem labeling that. And then when the mainstream America labeled it that, they also labeled it, in my opinion, more from a derogatory perspective. That's their music. Mm -hmm. And then they start saying it was, you know, well, it was, there were white people always involved in rap music. And it started crossing over. And then the, the million dollar question came up. Why does it have to be called black music? Why can't it just be called music? Do you know that what I'm telling you right now has happened with almost every African-American art form that's been created in this country? That question has mm -hmm. always come up at some point. And in reality, what I feel like it is, is what they're saying is we like it now, too. But we're not comfortable with it being called African-American music. We want it to just be called music. Now, that may be a simplistic explanation. But if you look back in history, jazz dealt with the same issue. Rock and roll dealt with the same issue. Funk dealt with the same issue. Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to mention disco. Uh, I might, someone might kill me if I do. So I'm going to skip <laughs> over disco. R&B dealt with the same issue. And so my point there is that they are welcome. Anybody's welcome to listen to rap music, you know, at any point in time. But why do we need to relabel it? just so that you can listen to it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's that whole, I want to feel comfortable in this space kind of thing. But I, I kind of feel like sometimes that's disingenuous, you know, especially when they have so many other outlets to go to. I mean, there's several places I know on the internet where I listen to other podcasts and I've sent the person's email. Uh, and I was very cordial. I said, hey, I like your podcast with different designers. Can you add some more designers of color? You know, and I asked, asked the question, I, and I asked it very, you know, very cordially. It, you know, when I do stuff through text, I'm not trying to drag people through the mud because it's just too many things can go wrong mm -hmm. that way. And that's why I said I appreciate yours. And so there's so many other outlets that they can go to to make their voice heard. I mean, it, right now, I don't have I know about four or five different podcast places that do what you're doing. And it's not people of color. Mm hmm. You know, and I've asked them questions. None of them have asked me. And maybe I'm not important enough. I don't, don't say know. that. I mean, don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> and when I say that, too, I mean that tongue in cheek. I, I don't feel like I'm not. But I'm saying in their mind, mm -hmm. maybe they think I'm not important enough. I don't feel that way about myself. But which is to me a challenge, which is the challenge I put to them. If I'm not important enough, then that's an issue that you have to grapple with, not me. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I leave it. I leave that in their court. I don't put that on anymore. When I did when I was young, I don't put that anymore and carry that with me. And that's what I don't want young black creators to do is to carry the burden of someone else's perception that has power to carry that burden on themselves. 
we shouldn't have to do that. Oh, absolutely not. And I mean, I can tell you, even in the the almost four years that I've done Revision Path, you know, we're over 175 episodes. There hasn't been, well, there, there's been two things that I found that have happened. The first is that the show often gets conflated with being something with blacks and technology. Yeah. Like it gets, it gets, it gets lumped in with that moniker and that community. And I'm, and I, I really tend to be pretty explicit in saying, well, it's, it's a design show. It's a design right. podcast. Like we're not even in a technology category on iTunes. It's, it's going to be under arts and design. It's not going to be under technology or anything like that. And the second thing is that I have not seen the industry at least. And when I say the industry, I mean, design podcasts in general. I have not seen where they are stepping up their diversity of guests right. at all. And I don't know if it's because they're cognizant of my show and feel like because of that, they don't have to. That's me thinking in a, in a vain way, but <laughs> you, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if that's what it is, but it's like, clearly the people we're out here doing it. And I'm, you know, my show has, you know, gotten, the attention of AIGA has gotten the attention of big companies and sponsors. So it's not like I'm doing this in a vacuum, you know what right, I mean? Right. But I haven't seen where the rest of the design community is even paying attention, I guess, you know? Would you say that also about the design conferences that, that happen, like how and AIGA, because I don't go to any of those conferences. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> and, and, and I keep hearing that they're, becoming more diverse and I'm seeing tweets and I'm seeing Facebook and I'm sitting there like, uh, okay, I'm not sure what that means. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull the curtain back <laughs> on something that will probably not only get me in trouble, but also probably won't get me invited to any other of these conferences. But what I found is that they tend to treat diversity largely as an afterthought with most of these conferences. It's about, you know, yeah, it's about the, the subject matter, but they also want to sell tickets. And so they want right. to make sure that the people that they book are going to have an audience that's large enough to garner people to want to buy tickets. Unfortunately, when you look at, I don't say unfortunately, when you look at the design industry and what's reflected back to us in documentaries and magazines and books and podcasts, it's not black designers. It's not really designers yeah. of color in general. And so I know that I will get at least, and I'll say, I'll use last year as an example, I got over a dozen design conferences, small to large, in mm -hmm. my inbox asking me as a last minute Hail Mary attempt to quote unquote add some diversity. Wow. Well, do you know anyone that we can, you know, speak to or know anyone that we can talk to? And the problem with that comes is, you know, one, it's a short notice kind of thing. Right. Two, when they ask it that short, you know, that close to when they're having the conference, it often means they've exhausted their budget. So they're, they want to try to add the diversity, but either they want to add it for a little money or for no money. Right, right. So they want you to speak for free or pay right. your own way to get there and they'll waive the registration. And it's like, it's a hassle, you know, I mean, yeah. and this is from, from small conferences to, mm -hmm. to large conferences. Some will ask my input and I may give my input and, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that they will take it, but I will, you know, I'll supply it. Plus, uh, I would be mad at you if I would be mad if you came to me and you passed that along to me. When I reason why I would be mad is because here's a situation that you, Maurice, wouldn't even walk into. And then I'm thinking, so he thinks I want to walk into it, you know, <laughs> but I mean, but what you would do is you would you would lay out to me all of the reality, the pros and cons of it. And I assume that you would do that. But I, yeah, I, that's that's my point. What you just said. My point there is my question also would be, what's your percentage of folks of color who've been showing up? Because I'm very adamant about also wanting to speak to people of color. And, mm -hmm. and and when they say, well, uh, when they start waffling on that, I'll go, you know what, then I'm going to be speaking to your people. And frankly, I think people of color need to see me more yeah. than your people do. Yeah. And that's my perspective, too. I, I'm not saying that's the only way to go about it. That's one way to go about right. it, you know, or whatever. But I appreciate your thoughts on that, because I don't I don't really go to them. I do have the money to go to them, but I just, I'm like, 
I am not going to be sitting in the corner by myself mm -hmm. at this event. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be sitting here thinking I'm crazy because I'm like, dang, they ain't got nothing that caters to. Because that stuff will make you think you crazy. Yeah. That's that's the thing about it that really bothers me. You'll be sitting around like, maybe it's me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And you know and, it's not you because you've got the years of experience. You've got the projects. You've got the skills. So you know what you bring to the table. You know your value and your worth. But then you go to these kind of events and you don't. I don't know. It's not recognized or it's not, and not say you got to like be lauded or anything like that, but right. you go and you feel like, you know, they're treating, you know, you don't feel like you're part of the group. Right. Right. And that afterthought point I think is a very good point. And that's the thing that I'm looking for. Cause then I don't feel like I'm being brought to the table. I'm being brought to the children's table mm. when they do stuff like that, Yeah, yeah. you know, and, and it's like, sit over here. We'll let you know when we have space at the big table mm -hmm. and, I, like I said, Maurice, I'm not saying it has to be me. I am certain, even if I don't know them, that there are some other black designers out there who have way more experience than me, probably won way more awards than I have, that are killing it, that would maybe even be more suitable. You know, I'm not saying I can't do it. I know I could do it. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that I'm open to the fact that if it was you, for instance, there, and knowing what you do, that would be a motivation for me to go, wow, they got Maurice. I know what this this cat is doing on the Internet with his podcast. That would make me think twice about, man, maybe I should try to show up. I can I can kind of conference with them a little bit and we can swap notes. Uh -huh. That'd be great. You know, but that's the point. Like, I also got to get better at making sure I'm making connections to people in the industry. So but I don't like you said, I just don't. I got the money, but it's a risk. <laughs> it, no, it is a risk. I mean, you know, you're paying for travel for multiple right. days, lodging. It's it's totally a risk. Well, first, I appreciate you saying that about if I were speaking somewhere, you would come because I, I don't get invited to speak at conferences very often. I do send out. I mean, I do apply to conferences like they'll send out a call for speakers or something like that. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'll get in nine times out of ten. I don't. But for the ones that I do. I will make sure to kind of let people know. So yeah. I'll, I'll give you two examples of conferences and I don't want to dwell too much on, on sure. conferences, but it'll, you know, kind of give you some insight onto where it comes from. I think from the, from the, the conferences end and we've had designers on the show. Don't get me wrong. That also put on their own conferences. If you want to go back and listen to the archives, the episodes with Ron Bronson and with mm -hmm. Marshall shorts, they both yeah, put on design yeah. conferences they both can can kind of speak to it more from I think the logistical standpoint, but there's one conference, and I don't want to mention names because they, I probably already called them out on here before. But there's one conference I know that at one point in time they were really kind of doubling down on diversity. There were several people, other black designers that were talking to them about how come the conference is in this city that happens to be majority black, but you don't have any black panelists or anything like that. And people right, kind of right. pressured them to say, you know, it should be a more diverse event. And so for one year, they did do a more diverse event. And they had these panels that talked about design and race and design and sexuality and like these different kind of topics. Mm -hmm. The problem that ended up happening was the audience didn't respond to it. The audience was like, well, we came for a design conference. We didn't come right. for a social justice conference. Right. <laughs> and when I tell you the next year they did a complete 180. And now mm -hmm. they're like every other cookie cutter design conference out here. You've got big name one, two, three. You've got, you know, medium designers in the industry. And then you look at the roster and it's little to no people of color. Right. But that's, that's what sells. And they like move to a bigger venue and they sell out more tickets. But it's it's odd and sad, honestly, that that was kind of the outcome of it. And they know I guess they know their audience because that's the same question I ask about Philadelphia is. I do peek at Philly AIGA and they, they're doing a, they do a lot of interesting things and stuff like that. But I do Philly is almost 50 percent African-American, mm -hmm. almost 50 percent. And I'm thinking and I'm saying to myself, there has got to be more black creators here, whatever that means. OK, yeah. and that's why I don't want to just say designers. I'm putting advertisers, marketers, whoever wants to put in that that boat. And I think that that's to me. I'm looking at that like, no, nah, that's just this just can't. And I and part of it, too, is that when I meet students, when I meet minority students that are in college, 
I would say three out of five of them are studying some form of creative field. So I'm thinking in my mind, like, I mean, I went to Best Buy the other day, and the guy who was upgrading my phone is a student at the Art Institute of Philadelphia getting ready to graduate. And I started talking to him about it, and I gave him my card, and I said, hey, man, I, I he was he's in an animation. I said, I don't know what your work looks like. I'm willing to review it because I, I am looking to subcontract some animation stuff out using certain programs. And I put the ball in his court. I said, here's my card. You're graduating this year. Contact me. Yeah. You know, and if you want to give me some information, look at your portfolio, I will. You know, but what I'm saying is that every time I turn around, I meet some student in college that's African-American or black or whatever. Half the time they're in the creative field. And I'm just like thinking in my mind. But when I look at the events and the photos after the fact, mm -hmm. the photos tell on you. And I'm just like, <laughs> hey, really? Seriously? So that and like, it's funny you say that. That leads me to my second example. So there is a conference, large conference. I'm not going to name the name, but I think for people listening, they probably already know. Large conference. They have it usually in a different city every year. It's like a five day design conference. It's one of the biggest design conferences in the country. Last year, I know they were super talking about we want this to be the most diverse design event possible. I mean, and I was talking to the one of the design organizers that was saying all this stuff about it. And I was like, yeah, that's great. I know a bunch of people that I think would be great. You know, let me know when we need to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. When I tell you these emails never went answered that I would mm -hmm. send. I would, and I even ended I mean, I ended up going to the events, saw the guy there. And even then wouldn't even engage in a conversation with me about, you know, kind of the diversity of the event. Now, to their credit, it was a pretty diverse event in terms of the the level of speakers and things of that mm -hmm. nature. Now they're putting it on again this year. Uh -huh. Look at the roster. There's like one black person out of 50 speakers they've announced so far. Right. And I'm thinking, right. hmm, okay. And like the event's in a few months. So I don't right. know if they're just going to try to like you know, shove some people of color in at the last minute. Right. They, do they, what you said, do what you said earlier where they yeah. just kind of say, Hey, last minute. Hey, you ain't doing nothing, are you? <laughs> yeah. But, but you what know. ended up happening from the event last year is that the recaps started coming out, the recaps and the photos and the videos. And when I tell you none of the people of color that spoke were featured in any of that stuff, it wow. was like, you had to be there to see us. Wow. Otherwise yeah. we, we were in the crowd somewhere. We, wow. we certainly weren't on stage. We certainly didn't have any top billing or anything like that. You wouldn't wouldn't be able to tell, which was, to me, really sad considering how they spoke so much to me about how diverse they wanted this event to be. And they had the diversity reflected in the speakers panel. But then you see the recaps from the organization and right. the people of color have been left out. Right. Right. Exactly. And that's matter of fact, it's interesting that you mentioned that because. I just entered a contest that I, my the local AIGA in Philadelphia put on called Design to Unite. Uh -huh. And matter of fact, I wasn't even going to do anything with it, but because we're um, you know, we're on that Facebook page, Black Designers United. Yep. Shout out uh, to BDU. Really, to be honest with you, I don't think I would have entered it if I hadn't been part of that page. I didn't even know that page existed. One brother found me, put me on it. I was like, I was like, I was getting ready to get off Facebook for that matter because <laughs> I just was like, man, I said Facebook is just, you know, this is a waste of time. And but anyway, I decided. I said, okay, I'm not a member, but it's open to anybody, so I'm gonna enter it. Matter of fact, if you get a chance, I threw it up on the page. It's on there. You can see it. And it was the deadline is today. It's a contest, so they have to decide what to put in. But the interesting thing about the poster is that I made it super large. Their dimensions was like, it can't be bigger than 32 inches. So I made it like, I don't know, 22 by 32 or something like mm -hmm. that. Cause I want my point to be made. And basically it's, it's the title of it is called the future is matter of fact, I took this idea from, from BDU that one young lady on there put up when she talked about, she gave this idea about Pantone and how, the design community can't seem to figure out, you know, we got all these diversity of colors, but can't seem to figure out <laughs> to become more diverse. And I that stuck in my mind when she said that. And so the poster is the future is not. And it says Panto 9021, which is like a pale pink cover. It says the future is not that. It says the future is CMYK. Mm -hmm. It's up there. And part of it is that I'm trying to make this point about 
diversity and inclusion. And it's a very colorful poster. I, I won't describe it. You can go look at it on your own. But the reason why I'm bringing that up is because I guess I'm thinking I kind of was just doing my own thing and I was fine with that. And I guess as I've met you and listened to your podcast and also encountered these other Facebook groups where people are doing similar things or other things, I've become a lot more like inspired and heartened. And so now I'm just kind of like, okay, I'll enter this contest. Let's see what happens. And people were encouraged, you know, people were in there like, hey, if you can do something, you know, we got to make sure that we're also getting the word out when we can. In that sense, I'm feeling a sense of renewed interest in not necessarily in becoming part of these groups, but continuing to talk about this topic. Because my attitude in the past was like, I'm done with it. That's y'all problem. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do what I do, blah, blah, blah. And I still feel that way, but I'm feeling also like, okay, there may be opportunities for me to get some platforms that I need to speak into. Yeah. You know, so I'm selective about them. There are places where I've said, I've asked, do you this, do you that? No, then I'm not the dude for you. Mm -hmm. You know, don't call me in February. Don't call me around in the okay <laughs> day. You know, that kind of stuff. Right. I, I get those phone calls like, and, and like you said, Maurice, it's always last minute someone dropped out. And then I've had to go to a friend and say, you recommended my name for that, right? Yeah. Don't do that. If it's not something that you will do, mm -hmm. you won't that, that you won't do. If it's not something that you're going to do and you have your reasons, maybe I have the same reasons. Yeah. He can still tell me about it, but let me know what your concerns are because mine's might be the same or I might go oh I can handle that let yeah. me go and I'll speak mm -hmm. you know and so anyway well I've, I've even been more selective when when companies and stuff come to me about what I will be willing to pass out to other people because I'll let them know like if it's not a paid opportunity don't ask me to ask my community about it because right. the work of right. people of color when it comes to not just design but I think in general tends to be undervalued or devalued or not valued so much. I don't want to put any of the people that I've met throughout doing this show in the position where they're doing work for free. We've right. all, I think, right. reached some level in our career, whether we are just getting out of school or if we're seasoned professionals, we right. should at least be compensated for our work and for our creativity. And clearly, if you're seeking us out, you need to make that compensation available. I mean, there certainly have been conferences where I'm like, no, I'm not going to let people know if you can't pay them, then good luck. And right. I know that no, they're, and no. I know that they're trying to do their outreach and hopefully people that try to do this outreach are listening to this episode to know, like, stop. The, the problem that I'm seeing is that what they're doing is they're like passing out the scraps. Right. And expecting us to just be able to grab and gnaw at them, fight over them because right. like we're getting this little bit of opportunity. I'm like, no, if we're not going to get the same level of opportunities that other folks are getting that our peers are getting in this industry, then you can keep it. Right. It doesn't, it no, doesn't make any sense. Right. You know, I know you, you might feel like you can pat yourself on the back cause you let me know about this call for speakers. That's due. I don't know, less than a week before it's, it's closed, but yet it's been open for the past three months. Right. Oh, can you let your community know about it? So why? So they can rush and scramble and put something together at the last minute that you're probably not going to, going to accept. Because your yeah, call for speakers yeah. has been open so long? How is, that, big, how is that helping anybody out? And that's a big issue, too, like you said, um, the whole issue of spec work. And then the only people who can afford to do even speak at that level and do it for free if they do it, people of color, are people who are already up in the stratosphere where some of us are not at. And I don't begrudge them at all. I'm, I'm glad that they're doing well. There are a few folks out there who are on that level or whatever. They can do it because their business is is booming on all levels. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some of us out here, though, where see, that's the thing. I'm not necessarily interested in being large. I don't think that's not my goal. My goal isn't to be large and to have people chasing. What I mean by that is that is because of technology it's allowed me to do some things on a level that I can still keep my hands in every aspect of what I do. And then what I'll do is I'll subcontract out pieces, but I'll make sure I pay people a market rate and also based on their experience and what they're able to do. That sort of thing. I mean, I'm going to be paying a design intern. I mean, there are folks that don't even pay them, but I'm paying a person because I know what it's like to be in college and be young and be African-American 
and not and come from a family that can't support you. Mm-hmm. You know, the, whatever money you're making is everything to you. I mean, I put myself through school, so I don't want to go to a young intern and say, hey, look, I got the money to pay you, but I'm not going to pay you. This is experience for you. Granted, maybe some places that's appropriate, but I don't ever feel comfortable suggesting that. And the other thing is if people can't pay me, the first thing I'm okay with people telling me up front that they don't have the money. But the first question I asked them is, what do you have to barter? Mm -hmm. Now, I shouldn't even be saying this on a podcast because I don't want people (laughs) calling me trying to barter. But, But generally, it has to be people that I know that I or someone's recommending them. But I've bartered services with people, you know, but they have to be comparable. I'm not going to look for I'm not going to look in your background to see what do you have that I want? You got to tell me, especially if you're coming to me. Now, if I go to other people, I'll do the same thing. I'll go to them and say, hey, I have this skill. You have that. You said you need this. I'll give it to you for this if you can give me access to that. Mm hmm. And I've had that work really well. But honestly, I keep that quiet. And here I am running my mouth on your podcast. I <laughs> probably shouldn't be doing. But, but part of that is also the fact that money isn't the only... It, it is important to function. I'm not saying that. But I also recognize that there are other things that someone has that I would have to pay for anyway. Yeah. So, and if they don't want to barter, I don't begrudge them, though. I don't, okay, okay. Or they may think that the it's not worth it. I'm fine. I'm like, I'm not going to talk them into it. I'm like, okay. All right. Well, how much do you charge for your services? Sometimes people can't barter at that time. And they'll say, I can't do that right now. I really got to focus on my bottom line. I don't yeah. argue with them on that because I know what that feels like as well. Let's switch gears here a little bit. Cause I, I know we, we've been talking about conferences. We've been talking about, you know, kind of, I don't know, the more insidious things that might happen in this industry. Let's, let's turn it around. Let's make it a little bit, more positive. So you mentioned you're a family man. How many kids do you have? Four. Four kids. Um, yep. My oldest is in is in college right now at Columbia University. Wow. And and my youngest is is I have him. He's eighteen. I have a sixteen year old. I have a thirteen year old, and I have a ten year old. So I had to think about that for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Are your kids interested in design? My oldest was at one point, and don't throw stones at me. I, when he was younger, and I, I, I think I may have pushed him away from it. So I don't know if I should say push him away from it. I was making him aware of some of the difficulties that come with the profession, uh-huh. and uh, I wasn't only talking about them. I talked about both sides, and I talked about my life and how I've be, dealt with it. But I said, I'm not saying this has to be you, but this may come with it. And he has a strong aesthetic side to him. But somewhere along that time, it was leaning also really hard towards engineering. So the one thing he he's at Columbia studying engineering, but I always told him, don't neglect the aesthetic side. I said, you may be able to bring something new to engineering or you might switch gears and go into something else and take engineering principles with you, Mm -hmm. you know, and so. I kind of was a little nervous about it at first, but then I I wouldn't say I pushed him away from it. I just talked to him a little bit about the realities of it when he was 12 or 13. Yeah. He didn't move away from it. He kept drawing and and his, his artistic skills started directing themselves very specifically towards technical drawing and Mm -hmm. blueprint type stuff. And that segued into engineering and he got involved in robotics. He was the president of robotics at his school and that sort of thing. So, He's going to take, I was encouraging while he's there, take some art classes. I said, you just never know how that's going to inform what you study or might completely flip the script. So we'll see what happens with them. And all my other kids are involved in some form of the arts right now, just more as a, you know, like my youngest daughter is about, she takes ballet lessons. My son, my son who's 13 is showing flair and cooking. My daughter is uh, interested in fantasy writing. So I tend to help them see the aesthetics and what they're doing rather than directing them towards design. Yeah. You know, that's more what's important to me is that I think that that creative side often gets lies dormant in a lot of adults I know. 
who, hey, man, I used to draw a lot when I was a kid, so what's stopping you now? Well, I can't make a living doing it. I said, I'm not saying you need to make a living doing it. Some of us can make a living doing this. Some of us can't. Yeah. Uh, and that's okay. For some of us, it's a hobby. It still can bring you joy. And so I focus on that aesthetic side, and I see that in everything in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's important that you kind of, you know, flourish that that uh, creativity within them because it applies to each of the things that they're doing. It certainly applies in fantasy writing. It right. applies in cooking because, you know, it's it's not just about how it tastes, but how it looks as well. Right. It, it certainly applies in engineering if you think about drafting and architecture and all that kind of stuff. So it applies to, to all those things in some sort of way. Right. And that's partly the main thing I want them to get from the experience. And for it, the, the, the other side is that you notice, Maurice, you know how schools have been cutting their arts programs and music programs. And, you know, I've done research on that area, man. And kids are really missing out now. There's a certain type of creative type of problem solving that comes with learning how to play an instrument mm -hmm. or learning how to draw or wherever it is that some schools just are not offering anymore. And it's unfortunate because if I hadn't had the art classes I had in elementary and middle school, I don't know if I would be a designer today. You know, really. And what do you, so what I, do you think you would have been? I was always sharp academically. Uh -huh. And, you know, someone talked about this in an article about why there aren't that many designers of color. And, and it's not just about racism and discrimination. It's also about what our families believe is important and sustainable. And that tends not to be the arts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that tends to be doctor, lawyer. So people was like, yeah, man, you get straight A's. You can be a doctor. You, so when I was in college, when I would see my family, my extended family, I had to constantly tell them what I was. So what are you doing again? Now, when someone asks you like that, you know, that's not positive. <laughs> and after a while, I stopped telling them. I just was like, I'm, yeah. just, I'm in college. I'm, yeah. I'm doing some stuff. Because I, you know, because then people was like, why aren't you a doctor and a lawyer? And I'm thinking, I'm getting advice from friends in my neighborhood who don't have a legacy education in their families and themselves aren't educated. And they're telling me what I need to be doing. You can't make money being a designer. How do you know? <laughs> right. And I started buying into that at some point. And then I started doing research and I was like, this is wrong. You can make money. And this was pre internet, you know? And, and so in that, in that sense, I, I just want to be able to, have people understand that that this is viable, that it's 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 more competitive now than it used to be, but it's it's still viable. And there are some people who are not formally trained, who are designers too, and God bless them. There, some of those people have written in history books, but they're I always remind people they're the exception. The LeBrons are the exception, not the rule. The folks coming straight out of college, I mean, out of high school and playing basketball and doing really well. You know, yeah. or whatever. So it's it's important that folks understand, you know, that aspect. What's the best advice that you've been given about what you do? That is not really, that is bigger than design. I spoke at the college I went to, University of Arts, had a 50-year celebration for graphic design. So they had, my professors were there, other people I didn't know were there, some big name people that you would, if I said their names, you would know who they are. I came back. Mm -hmm. And they wanted me to speak. Now, my first reaction was to say, no, that was my first, <laughs> first reaction because my time there didn't go very smoothly. And it wasn't all their fault. Some of it was me, too. But it was also some racial and cultural stuff. But uh -huh. they asked me to speak. And <clears throat> one of my professors, the one thing I kept hearing from him when I was there is that this is bigger than graphic design. And so the books that he he wrote. When you read his books. He don't he talk about design and art theory, but you know what he spent a lot of time talking about? And this is what clued me in. Anthropology, sociology, the, the people he's quoting, mm -hmm. anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, all through his book. These are the people he's quoting. And I begin to catch on to that. And so that kind of helped me. That's one reason why I went back and got the master's degree. Part of it was that I wasn't sure I was going to stay in the graphic design field because I was like, I need I need a buffer. I need something else. And, you know, we got to be twice as good, unfortunately. So yeah. I went and got the master's degree. But then it also continued to deepen my understanding of design and what I what I do. And so that's the big thing 
And there's, I think a lot of young black creatives have caught on to that. Some of them are taking their aesthetics into community building and community organizing. Oh yeah. And, and things of that nature. I mean, that's, that's an even a better extension of it. I'm not even talking about it at that level, but I'm glad to see that I was doing it, but I was doing it and I still do. I was doing it very quietly behind the scenes, you know? So that's the one thing I learned. And now what they call it today is the social impact of design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's some of us, honestly, I've been involved in trying to help young people for the last 20 some years. So this social impact thing, this ain't new to me. That's new to them. Yeah. You know, uh, for those who, oh, wow, we can actually use design for social good. I was teaching kids in elementary school how to draw letter forms that create their own alphabet. I had them create their own alphabet, the whole class of elementary school kids. And then they had to write notes to each other. And it and then what happened is that they went to different classes in this after school program that I helped start and they were passing these notes. And the teachers in the program were like, what does this say? I don't they got these markings and stuff because I didn't tell them what we were doing. I started laughing. I said I taught them how to create their own alphabet. And they were like, they didn't believe me <laughs> that I taught them <laughs> how to do that. And it was a simple thing. We just removed some horizontals and some verticals and some ascenders, descenders and all that. It was these okay. elementary school kids. So to me, that was my way of recognizing how I could use design principles to help young people. And that's the thing I would say to other people is that there's nothing wrong with doing good design and just that. But for people like me, it has to be bigger than that. I have to find ways to give back to the types of community that created me. Mm -hmm. And when I say created me, I'm not going to lie to you. There's also dumb stuff that I learned from my community, too, but that, that I don't embrace as an adult. But I've learned how to be resilient from my community. And, and I know a lot of other black people can identify with that. And I want to be able to there's some of us that need extra help. Yeah, it's not that we're not resilient. We just need some extra help. And that's what I feel like my schooling couldn't teach me. They couldn't teach me how to reach people that were like me. Mm -hmm. They could, but they could say, Hey, design is life is bigger than that. Cause for some people design is life. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's great. You know, um, <laughs> the fact that that squares over on the light, right. And it's in the circles down the bottom and how it floats your boat and the kerning, that's great stuff. And I know about that stuff, but it has to go deeper for me. For There's just too much at stake. I feel a responsibility not to make neighborhoods healthy. I can't do that. But I can impact individuals. I can mentor someone. I can encourage someone, you know, as much as I can. There's two things you said there that I kind of want to touch on briefly. So the first was you said that you didn't have the best time in design school. That's at the University of the Arts, correct? Yes. I know that there's been folks that I've had on the show before that when they've spoken about their time at a design school, it's often in a very bittersweet kind of tone. Like, yep. yes, they learned what they needed in order to, you know, be a working designer, but they didn't feel supported or they didn't feel like the the institution really took into account the any sort of cultural differences that would make right. that would make their experience different from their peers. Is that sort of what, what it was like for you? Yep, you nailed it. I tried, and I wasn't the only one there dealing with it. There was a, several other black students in the program too, but not many others. But that is exactly what I dealt with. So when I tried to introduce the things that were important to me at the time, aesthetically, like for instance, I came up through that graffiti era. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was a graffiti artist, but I was too scared to put it on walls. So I put it on paper and I put it on jackets and hats and stuff like that. Yeah. But I was into that. And I was seeing some overlap between what I was learning about design and graffiti. And I remember bringing it up in class and all I got was a no. I hmm. started seeing connections between African-American folk art and what I was learning. And I felt like and, and when I look back on the no I got, it makes me angry. But more and more, I'm realizing that it just makes me sad because what it just reflected it was their limited knowledge about things. Exactly. And and I think when I was younger, it, I took it personally. And I'm not saying I shouldn't have, 
I didn't always know how to express that at the time, other than throwing daggers through them with my eyes. And, and also this the culture shock I was going through being there and the fact that it was this Swiss style design. So there was a, there was a really strong European flavor, in my opinion, with the way they did things as a result of that. Yeah. And so there was no room. I felt like there was no room for me to express the context that I came from. And so I did do it, but I did it in small ways. I, at the time, the style was uh, wearing African medallions. This was the public enemy era. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wore African medallion. I, you know, at the time, I made sh- my hairstyle was cultural. I didn't do it just to impress them, but that was who I was. I was getting box haircuts. I was getting step haircuts. I was <laughs> whatever it was. Yeah. And that was the best that I could do. But as I got out and I started to grow and I started to travel globally and reading more, I began to realize, man, these folks don't know everything. That mm-hmm. was the one thing. And number two, what they do know, I thought was valuable, but was limiting for me. And so I started the journey. And, and I would even suggest that design school is not meant to teach you everything. That's the one defense I'll give them is that you're not supposed to learn everything there. But I do believe that they could have been a little bit more understanding of the context. And there were some professors there that were. I just didn't have them as my professor in terms of teaching me. So I do go up there now, roam around the University of the Arts. One of those professors wasn't mine, but he's always been that one person that I could talk to back then. And he's not black, but he was he was tapped in as much as he could be. And I appreciated and I had a long talk with him. When I went, because I once I graduated, I didn't touch that place for like 25 years. Mm-hmm. For 20, 25 years, I was like, y'all ain't never going to see me again. But as time went on and I grew in my understanding, I went back over there. He was still there. And I sat down and told him my story. I said, y'all were brutal. I, I told him that. And he, and he was open to that. He was like, you're right. And he said to me, do you know that I was telling them what you're saying? I was telling the other professors that back then. But they weren't listening. And so they've changed their methodology. Like I know about teaching methodology and pedagogy because I've taught elementary, middle and high school and college classes. OK, they are now better at understanding context than they were in my day. You know, so I make sure when I teach classes, the first thing I do is I ask students, where are you from and why are you here? And then I ask them, what do you want to get out of this? And then we keep that context in mind. I keep it in mind as I teach. And I try to point them or I ask them, point me to places where you see a connection with what we're learning here and what you know. So what happens is I learn from my students as well. You know, I learn about things that I don't know about and I'll say, wow. And then I'll go, can you recommend a book? In that sense, I think that I do feel like I got one of the best education, design educations in the world. But I feel like I walked through fire, man, to to get through that program. And when I spoke there, I told them that. I said some of that stuff. And after I was done, the primary people that came up to me to talk to me about what I said to them was primarily African-Americans who had graduated from the program before me, who I had never met. They said, we know exactly what you went through. And they said, for us, it was worse. People who may have graduated like five years before me. And I was like, wow, that was something. And I, and, and so I was excited to meet them because I knew who they were. I spoke it in a intellectual context, but the big thing I said to them was the real world needs me more than graphic design ever did. And I still believe that to this day. And I told them that, because you know, what I'm supposed to say is graphic design is my life. (laughs) I eat, breathe, and sleep it. I can't live without it. That's what I'm supposed to say. You guys are the best thing since sliced bread. And I got an email a couple months later from the professor who invited me. He said, thank you for not just giving out a Valentine, (laughs) which is what almost every other speaker did. Fine. I don't have a problem with that. And I didn't sit there and go, you know, do the hood thing where I'm front and go, let me tell y'all about yourselves. I didn't do that. Yeah. But... I did it enough that they knew what I was talking about, you know, so those kind of opportunities to me are, I think are important when they do come, but they don't come. They're not frequent. So are you where you wanted to be at, at this stage in your life? Maurice, I'm surprised I'm still alive, man. I mean, it's really that simple. 
for every person like me that made it out of North Philadelphia, there's nine dudes that didn't. And so I do feel like a late bloomer in that respect. Like sometimes I say, if I hadn't grown up poor in my situation that I grew up in, dysfunctional family, would I be further in life than I am? Probably I would be, but I wouldn't trade my experience for the world because my experience allows me to speak into other people's lives. It helps other people avoid, you know, the certain things that I fell victim to or whatever. But I would say I am content with where I'm at. I'm not at a point where I'm trying to get the design community's attention like I was when I was younger Mm -hmm. as much anymore. I feel good about the work that I'm doing. And sometimes I do work where I'm still like, dang, I could have went further with that. (laughs) My main thing is I'm just happy I can do what I'm doing and take care of my family. The rest is gravy as far as I'm concerned. Me and my wife both are entrepreneurs. She has a hairstyling salon that she opened this earlier this year. Mm -hmm. So we're both doing it. You know, we got to be on our grind in many ways. And, And our kids are, you know, we told them, look, we need you to help us with our businesses. You know, and so I have them do small things for me. Mostly they help my wife. Like my wife might need someone to answer phones <laughs> at her salon <laughs> or something like that. Uh-huh. For me, I'll be honest with you. I put my work in front of them okay. and I'll say, I'm working on this logo idea. This is what it's for. This is the audience. What do you guys think? They're, they're your not focus my group. Prim- primary, but they're part of my focus group. Yeah. And they'll say the hard stuff. Dag, dad, this what is, I don't even know what that is. Uh, and then I'm like, it's this stupid. You know, that's what I want to say. But <laughs> I don't tell my clients that, but I, I, a lot of the focus group information I solicit when I'm working on work, most of the times, not even designers, it's ordinary people. And I give them a context to understand it. Mm-hmm. And I say, what you think? It's not wrong with asking designers. I'm not saying that, but I just find that ordinary folks are a lot more truthful about, what they're saying. And, and not only that, they're not always right either. I'm not saying they're always right, but it gives me a better f- framework for what I'm doing. Now, you know, I said there were, were two things that I got from what you mentioned earlier. The second thing was that you took a break from design. Yeah. Did this happen because of your educational experience? No, I started wondering if I had a future in design. I was probably... In my getting, I was around 30. That probably did it. And I just was, I liked what I was doing, but I still felt like I wasn't at the level where I thought I should be. Mm -hmm. And you really shouldn't be. And then when you combine that with being 30 years old, that's a bad combination. I was around 30 about that time. So I started thinking, really questioning what I had the future in design. So I always like working with young people. So I decided to work full time as a youth worker and keep my design skills intact on the side. During that time, I, I ran a T-shirt business that was selling shirts globally before even before PayPal. I was selling stuff through my P.O. box. They say you couldn't do that, but I was doing it. <laughs> and I was working in a, a housing project in Wilmington, Delaware. And so I was working with elementary school kids, middle school and high school kids. And uh, I did that for seven years and I moved my family down. At the time, I had one child. When I came back, I had three. No, I had four <laughs> when I came back. At the okay. seven years. And what happened was that during that time, I was also getting my master's degree. And once that time was coming to a close with what I was doing, I guess I was like, OK, I don't know. If, doing youth work, there's not a lot of money in it, period. And I started saying, well, what am I going to do? And I started thinking about teaching. I could do that. And and I was getting my master's degree. So I, when I left that job, I came back and just became a communications director. But that time was very helpful because, again, it put me in contact with poverty that wasn't like the poverty I grew up with, number one. So it gave me a better understanding of what folks are dealing with now in terms of poverty than when I grew up. Number two, it also allowed me to develop more media education ideas because I was seeing how media was impacting poor working class people. So I started developing workshops to do in schools to teach kids about media education and how the things that they're seeing impact their choices and things like that. And also giving kids a chance to express leadership. I mean, I 
had a group at a school where I had a student board of directors and they basically ran the programs at the school. I had a mentoring program, had after school fitness empowerment program, all that kind of stuff. The goal was to empower them and to give them some taste of leadership that might inspire them. And I have kids that I worked with down there that I'm still in contact with now that that are adults now that mm-hmm. I've known since third grade that I still mentor. Them, wow. You know, that still call me when they make a major transitions in their life. When they graduate from high school, they call me, hey, can you come? I'm there. I take off from work, go down Delaware. I'm there. Hey, I'm getting married. I'm there. Hey, I'm enrolling in school. I need some advice. Call me. Let's get together. It's a lot of kids. That I, it's hundreds of kids I work with, but it's now to like a small group of like three to five that look for me, mm-hmm. you know, uh, when they need something. And so I've committed to being there for them. I was doing that even when I was in college. When I was enrolled in college, I was going back to my high school recruiting kids to go to college. I wasn't being paid to do that <laughs> at all from the school. But I knew that education was where it's at. And I feel like my life is a a testimony to that. Now, education has changed a lot now. It's a lot more expensive. Some fields are difficult to make a living in. So I'm really focusing on that with my kids, too, and just saying, if you want to do this, you better minor in this. Mm -hmm. Like my daughter wants to be a fantasy writer. I said for every J.K. Rowling, there's like nine folk that's still living in their parents' basement. So if you're going to do that as your major, minor in journalism, you know, so that you can still if you, you know, and if she takes off and does something great, you know, but she has a backup. So that's the one thing I focus on with young people is making sure they understand that some professions have changed dramatically. Yeah. So you some like design. I tell people now you either have it or you don't. (laughs) It's I'm saying to make a living doing it. No, that's you true. Either, that's true. You either have it or you don't, because now we got to compete with five dollar logos. We got to compete with spec work. We got to compete with crowdsourced stuff. And I would be scared if I came out of college now as a young person. I would be very scared. I would be nervous. I won't say I'd be scared. I have some years under my belt. And so I've been able to establish myself. So no one hires me because of the software I can use. Whatever people hire me for the way I think. And my design abilities, those two things I've learned are very, very important because then they'll keep coming back. Yeah. When they start feeling like you broke the mold, they ain't gonna look for anybody else. Or if they do, they're going to come to you and say, hey, <laughs> hey, should I look for somebody else? I've, I've actually had that with a client that wanted me to do more PR work. And I said, no, I shouldn't do it. She said, why? I said, you're growing into a medium-sized to large nonprofit, you need access to someone who specifically focuses on that. I don't. I do it as an extension of branding. And she she said, even if I pay, I said, even if you pay, you need access to someone who can go above and beyond what I can do. I wasn't shooting myself in the foot. I would have just subcontracted it out anyway. (laughs) I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done it, Mm -hmm. but I figured if she had access to someone, Use that person. Then now I don't have to worry about it, but I still have a long-term contract with them. So where do you see yourself in the next five years or so? Like, what do you think is going to come up in the future? I am hoping that I can get more global work. I want to do more educating and speaking, but I'm trying to determine where I want that to be. I do that now. Like Temple University graduate program will call me to, to speak about, media nonprofits type of thing. I have a friend who's a professor and I'll come in and I'll do a workshop, but I, I just want what I'm doing to be directed to people of color. But I, I would say I'm, I'm hoping that in the next five years I can get some global work and that I can mentor more young designers of color. I just want to put them in the fast lane. I felt like I got to some places slowly because I didn't have a lot of mentorship. I feel good about what I've been able to do But I kind of feel like if they had mentoring, they may be able to jump into warp speed. Not that everything has to be fast, but that they could understand some things a lot faster and begin to avoid some things that I wasn't able to avoid. Yeah. So those are the two things that I think about. And if I can do those two things and my kids get through college or whatever they need to do and I keep all my teeth, I'm good. 
<laughs> you, you keep know? all your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm good, man. I, other than that, I'm, you know, I'm getting older, and I'm I gotta pay attention to what that means. But I want to stay streamlined. I'm not looking to be like a ten person agency. I just want to be. Not that it has to be just me, though. I want it to be me, and if I do hire someone else full time, that would be about it. But the rest is gonna be let's use technology to stay lean and mean. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, one thing with being an entrepreneur is that you really have to determine what success is going to look like for you because there's so much, well, I won't say it's so much, but it's so easy to compare your walk and your struggle and what you're doing, what other folks are doing, because entrepreneurship is always touted as like, you know, you can work from the beach and you can do, you know, you know, you could, you could travel the world and do all this stuff. And yeah, you can, but like you have to define as an entrepreneur, what success looks like for you. That may not be success for you. All that travel might be stressful. Working on the beach might be tough because you might get sand at your laptop, you know, like that, like that sort of stuff. But you have to determine what that, that metric of success is like for you and work towards that. So you can be fulfilled. It's not about what comparing yourself to other people's struggles. I know that's something that in the first God, like my first five years of business, I had to struggle hard not to make that comparison and really had to determine what does that, what does being successful look like for me? You know, does it mean having a big, large agency with dozens of employees downtown? Or does it mean having a small studio and having the opportunity to do the types of projects like Revision Path right. and, and be able to right. give back to the community and impact it in a way that can change the conversation? I'm glad that you are looking at it in that way. That's, that's a good way to look at it. And that's the entrepreneurial mindset basically is what you're what you're suggesting. And that's what I tell folks, leverage your your talent, but you got to get some skills first to be able to do that. Like too many kids are walking around with American Idol mentality like, um, <laughs> well, my grandma said I can sing. So I'm going to get up here and I sound just like Mariah Carey. And they get up there and then these these professionals tell them you're garbage. Mm-hmm. And then they're like man, who, what do they know? And I'm like, well, they know something, yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and so I'm, cause that's the other thing. Sometimes when we're young and we don't have a lot of encouragement, we have to tell ourselves that we are important, but we got to be careful that it doesn't become like that shallow. I'm the bomb type stuff. And that we put some, something behind it, some character, some skills, some whatever. And that can be hard to do that is hard to do by yourself. That's why I say I'm a late bloomer. I feel like I had to, people had to mentor me. Most of my mentoring came, didn't even come from the design community. It came from pastors and, and other people who took an interest in my life who knew about entrepreneurship. And so I teach my kids about college view college is an opportunity at entrepreneurship. So when you look at these different colleges, don't just look at where your friends are going. Don't just look at, oh, the campus pictures look nice. Look at what they're telling you they offer and stack that up against what you're seeing in the brochure and find someone who went there, who goes there and who has went there and stack it against their experience. Mm -hmm. You know, and so in the end, you know, you can get you may be able to get out of here with a full scholarship and not have any debt. That's my goal. If I can do that for my four children, man. You won't even hear from me anymore, Maurice, period. You know, (laughs) if I could just get them through school with very little debt, that's my goal. And that's my goal for other minority youth to say, because once they get out here, they're going to have to prove themselves more than just their skill. You know what I'm talking about. We got to be twice as good. Yeah. And who wants to be carrying a great deal of debt in some area where you can't make a living by trying to prove to people that you can do this in that area and that particular profession is struggling Mm -hmm. you know or whatever i'm not telling anybody to be a doctor lawyer i don't believe that but if you're going to go hard at the creative professions you better go hard you better have it and go hard and keep going you know you're going to have to blaze your own path basically to me revision path is you blazing your own path that's to me what excites me I mean, can you think of anybody, Maurice, that has been doing before you started this? Who else was doing it? And I'm talking about creatives of color. Who else was doing it? Hmm. <laughs> Who else was doing it? There were people that were doing it because I don't want to say like I was the first person to do it. But before me, I know that uh, Saida Mitchum, she's a she was a designer. She's not a designer anymore now. But 
she had a site called Inspiring Black Designers that was doing some interviews and stuff. And then our sites actually merged a while back, like back in 2014. But mm-hmm. before that, and this is stuff that's still going on. I mean, I don't think it's to the the frequency that I'm doing with Revision Path. But for example, uh, John Daniel, who's an independent creative director out of London, he had a website called Visual Intellectual, but he's also a columnist for Design Week, which is a really popular design publication mm-hmm. in the UK. And he has a column there called Four Corners, where he's always interviewing black designers. I think he does maybe two or three a month or something like that. But in terms of the, the frequency that I'm doing, and certainly within this medium where it's yeah. it's audio, where you can hear people's voices, I want to say I'm the only one. I don't know if there's been people before me that have done it, and I don't want to say that I'm the first, but right, right. I think I've certainly been doing it at this point the longest. Right. And, I, and maybe that's the point, too, is is you're more comprehensive. You've been in it for a while. And that's mainly what I'm, what I'm hinting at, is the fact that that you've stayed consistent with it. You could have said, no, I'm going to interview this. I'm going to interview some doctors. I'm going to interview some lawyers. You stayed in, on the creative path. And and I think that partly helps make it unique, especially for a lot, a lot of young creators where they're like, where are we at? And it gives us, the rest of us, an opportunity to learn what other people's experiences have been like. And some people's experiences have been, haven't been like mine. And I've been really impressed with that. Like, wow, they didn't, Feel like they walk through fire? Oh, mm, okay. <laughs> and that's and that's great though, because it mean, it means that maybe maybe something has changed or maybe something at their school was different than my experience. The one thing I've noticed too is and maybe I'm saying this because I'm here in the US, sometimes I feel like in, in the UK or in Europe, they seem to do a better job. I hear more about black creatives over there than I do here. Hmm. And I'm a I'm a little puzzled about that. I, I mean, it might be maybe it's because of where I'm looking. I don't know. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, like, where do you hear that from? Well, um, like this is a guy that works at Pentagram. That's oh, from, Eddie uh, Opara. Yeah, I don't know him, but I've read some really great stuff on him, and he's been like a little bit of the face of sort of black designers here, somewhat or whatever. But you know, I I forgot where I saw at least. I think I've seen stuff in creativeblock.com. Mm-hmm. There's a couple places where I've seen stuff and they've done stories. And I've found stuff on Black Designers United where someone put up something where someone from Europe does regular stories and not necessarily podcasts, but maybe even written. Yeah. And I'm just, and then I'll look around in the US and I'm just like, dang, I can't find anything. You know, I mean, I'll look <laughs> at how, I'll look at print. Uh-huh. I'm not saying they don't have stuff either. It may not be on their website or I don't have subscriptions to them. I, I won't have a scri- subscription to them. So, you know, there may be something in there. But, you know, I, I do know about several names in the industries I've heard about. And that's primarily because I've seen them in magazines like uh, Fast Company or I'll look at how conference speaker line up and I'll go, OK, I never heard of that person. Mm-hmm. Or I'll say I'm seeing this person's name everywhere now. So stuff like that. But I don't see articles. I don't, you know, and like I said, I could be looking in the wrong place or whatever. That's interesting. You mentioned that. Yeah. Eddie Opara certainly. And that's in large part, I think, due to the fact that he works for such a high profile agency for Pentagram. Right. He has sort of ended up becoming the go to. I don't say the go to person, but certainly when people mention black designer his name is what comes up because yeah. he's been featured yeah. on aiga he speaks at a bunch of different conferences he works for you know this really well-known agency and i mean i have a theory that i don't know if i want to say this on the show but <laughs> i'll go ahead and say it i have a theory that it feels like the the mainstream design community will only let so many of us at the table so to speak yeah. When it comes to being at that upper, upper echelon of being mm-hmm. able to be recognized where you're a peer with like, say, uh, uh, Michael Beirut or Debbie mm-hmm. Millman or a Paul Asher or, right. or something like that, where you're at that level of, of ubiquity within the design community. And I would even wager Eddie might not be at that level. Mm. He's visible, certainly, because he's, you know, a black designer, but I don't know if he'll be tossed around in the, co- in conversation in that same kind of way, if that makes any sense. 
That's a good point. And I, I was wondering that too. And I also had another theory of, I've also found that, and I've have friends in other professions and they've seen this. Sometimes it seems like in this country, people will gravitate to other black people who are not African American because they don't always bring the kind of questions that we bring to the table about certain things. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you know, black folks in the UK, their primary connection there is oftentimes uh, the Caribbean, you know, uh, Jamaica and other islands down there. Mm -hmm. And the relationship that Europe has with colonialism. Okay. Which that impacts their understanding. Whereas here it's our understanding of not just being brought here for those African Americans who African Americans who were the ancestors were brought here, but the ongoing discrimination and racism that happened even after slavery was abolished and, you know, still continues, uh, the racism and stuff we see still continue to this day. So it means that there are certain questions that I may ask that if a person from the UK comes here, wouldn't necessarily know to ask a white American, you know, whatever. So I, we, I've talked about that with friends in other professions too, because they're, because their histories are different, you know, Mm -hmm. or whatever. And so I've also wondered that, that, um, and this is not to take a slight at any black folks from other parts of the world at all. I'm not making this that, putting this against them at all. But I have experienced that sometimes because they're thinking that they won't bring the same level of scrutiny in certain areas that I would be an African-American and growing up in this system in this country. So, but who knows? I, it may be something else that we don't even think about either, but I suspect that it might be what you said as well. Yeah. And I mean, you, you talked about, you know, the, the actually the person that you mentioned the guy in the UK that does design column, that's that's John Daniel, who has also been yes, on the show yes, here. That's what I was thinking about. Okay. Um, and yeah, he, he's done, you know, he does, I think, about two or three of these interviews a week through Design Week. And, you know, is also a designer. I mean, he has his own, he's done exhibits and museums and things like that. So he's a designer well within his own right. Uh, so it's not right. just from this uh, kind of strictly journalistic viewpoint where he's coming from with these interviews. I do wonder about that because... You know, I've been doing, and I, I hate to, to turn this into a vain sort of thing, but I've been doing Revision Path for a while, and I mean, it's it's a struggle to mm. get recognized. It is a struggle. Wow. <laughs> and I mean, to the point where in 2015, and I, I did a, a presentation last year at Facebook as part of their lecture design series. And, you know, this is not something I've, I've really even told folks just in general but like i was gonna fold this whole thing up in 2015 oh, really? i wow. was like it's a wrap i was like I, I was like i don't feel like i'm getting respected i'm doing the work i'm reaching out to people i'm getting like the nastiest comments and emails and i'm just like why am i still doing this and yeah. i was trying to reach out to other design podcasters to be on their show or to find ways to collaborate and people either wouldn't respond or they'd respond in a really super negative fashion and call me racist and i mean it was really to the point where i was gonna fold this whole thing up and be like you know what this is good i was like we're gonna get to like a good round number of episodes like Mm -hmm. a hundred episodes or something and just end it and that's it because i don't i don't have to put up with all of this like this is something that i'm inviting into myself in some sort of way by taking in this criticism but i had to realize that you know it's important for me to just run my own race with this as opposed to you know, comparing what I'm doing with other folks and trying to seek that validation outward. Yeah. I can take solace in the fact that nobody else has, has amassed this level of interviews with designers, black designers from around the world. And it's still going, it's consistent, it's sponsored, it's doing well. So I should just take solace in that fact. And yeah. if the rest of the design community hasn't discovered it yet, or they feel some kind of way about it, I mean, you're more than welcome to start your own. No one yeah. has done so in four years. So right. clearly it's it's not a bad thing, I guess. So Well, yeah, and you some of it too is is I didn't even think about any of the stuff that you're saying. I mean, never even would have considered that that you would have thought about stepping away from this. The one thing that, that do that does cross my mind and I'm careful about saying this because I don't even know how it would happen, but I, you know, it's been crossing my mind. Like I I was said to myself, can folks like you or me or whoever, like either 
ask a design conference that is open to it or that we feel good about, can we have a sponsored area where we plan it specifically for folks of color or start our own design conference? I mean, that I have to admit, that's been crossing my mind a lot. Now, granted, I don't know how that would happen. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of money involved, <laughs> that kind of thing, uh, in making that happen, you know, or whatever. But part of it is that what I'm really suggesting is I keep thinking like, man, it would be great to meet up somewhere with folks like yourself. That's mm-hmm. basically what I'm saying. That's one, those two ideas are one ways and, and they may be a little bit more far fetched because there's a lot of work involved in that stuff. But that's basically what I'm saying is that I could, I'll be honest with you. I could probably go to a design conference and I could thrive if I knew that there was a group of creators there people there like yourself who really know what's going on that I can continue to see to remind me that I'm not crazy while I'm there for the four or five days. Mm-hmm. That would make it bearable for me to be able to deal with it. I'm like I said, I can be, and part of the reason why I say this, Maurice, is because we're accustomed to doing this. Yeah. You know, we're accustomed to being places where we're not given a whole lot and we we make something out of nothing. We're accustomed to doing it. I'm not saying that we need to feel like we need to do it all the time. But what I'm saying is that I'm, I would even be open to that. If I knew that, Hey, a year from now, if I knew five or seven creators, I knew that, that I've, well, we only take the risk, man. I don't know. Them well, I know some about them would commit to being at this thing and we would commit to just running together for whatever that means for four days. I'm good. You know, I mean, I know how to talk to other people. That's not an issue, but part of it is, is if I'm there on my own, it takes a lot more energy for me at this time in my life. I don't have that. I can't. What's the word I'm looking for? When I was younger, I could put up more of a facade for a longer period of time. Mm-hmm. The older I get, the more I don't want to do that and the more <laughs> I don't have the energy to do it. I hear you. So I'm not going to necessarily go ballistic and just throw the microphone across the, the whatever, but. You know, I'm at a point now where folks are like, yo, so how are you feeling? Yo, I'm just hating this right now. How can you hate this with all these designs? Because you know what? I don't see folks that understand my experience. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was younger, I might be a little bit more gracious and believe around the block, make them feel comfortable. So anyway, and I don't know, maybe that's happening at some of these conferences. I don't know. I mean, maybe somebody has already thought of that, but that's something we know how to do. And I'm not saying we have to stay doing that, but part of my concern is that we don't have any contact with each other. Yeah. And when I say that, I'm saying completely, I don't know how to solve that. I'm offering those ideas. They're far-fetched. Uh, I don't know, Skyping, Zooming, but I think that that, that question has to be addressed. That's We have to ask that question at some point. How do we have some contact with each other so that we're not thinking that we're crazy. Yeah. You know, so anyway, uh, I'll leave that for other folks to mull that over because maybe some ideas around it that I haven't thought of. Well, now in 2015, there was, and I don't know if you knew about this or maybe not, but there was a black and design conference that took place at Harvard. It was uh, in October of 2015 Oh, I never heard it. It was they didn't do too much publicizing around it uh, because it was the first year that they did the event. It was a two day event. um, Well, really like a day and a half, but it was two day event packed. It was packed. When I first heard about it, I think it was through I I forget exactly where I heard about it. I think I might have seen it on a blog somewhere. Someone had mentioned this black and design conference at Harvard. And I was like, let me let me take a look at this. It was affordable, like the most expensive ticket was 50 bucks. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, I can I can do this. I can make this happen. The way that the conference was structured, though, it was mostly around like urban planning, architecture, that uh, kind of design okay. stuff. Mm-hmm. And I know that I was mentioning it to a lot of designers who were, you know, visual designers, graphic, UI, UX, web, et cetera. And they're like, right. oh, well, I don't know if I want to go because it feels like, you know, they're not I mean, speaking to me. And I'm like. It's a black and design conference. (laughs) When are we ever going to have this in our working career? Let's just go. It's cheap. Let's just go. And I I swear most people, most of the black designers I talked to were like, Oh, I don't know. You tell us how it is. And I mean, I, I went, I covered it for revision path 
And it is the only professional event that I have been to where I felt affirmed as both a black person and as a creative. Wow. Like that's the, the, amazing. The, yeah. The way that they had it structured was, I mean, it was about urban planning and stuff like that, but what I got from it is that these are people that have taken their design knowledge and creativity and found ways to impact the real world. Mm -hmm. So they're doing things in their community, like structuring community dinners together. So their neighborhoods can eat better. They're designing city plazas and taking into account the history of the area. They're working and using their design knowledge to preserve African-American landmarks and things of that nature. So it was, I got a lot from it and it actually ended off with a, a keynote from Phil Freelon and Daryl Crooks. Daryl Crooks at the time was the art director at the Atlantic. Now he's mm -hmm. an art director at Apple and Phil Freelon is one of the chief architects along with David Ajay who designed the National Museum of African American History and Culture at the Smithsonian. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so that ending keynote was like them talking about the process behind building the building and why it looks like that with the tiered crowns and and all this sort of stuff. And so mm -hmm. to me it was an amazing event. Like it's an event that is still stuck with me to this day. Actually the videos of the event are still on YouTube. You just search for black and design you should be able to find it i mean they live streamed yeah. the event there was a a free catered meal by bryant terry who's like a, a famous chef like and it was 50 bucks i'm like how could you not go to that you know yeah. like yeah, thinking, oh well they're not cheap. gonna be they're not gonna be talking about you know css so what yeah, yeah. just go just go it's yeah. a black no, and design I event there's never probably gonna be a they are planning on doing one from what i've heard they're planning on doing one this year Mm -hmm. I think they're working on it now because when yeah. I went to go look at the website the other day, they changed it. Like it was this like dark black website with uh, mm -hmm. the information from 2015 and I checked it now and it looked like it was just a plain WordPress template. So that says to me that they're probably working on it right now. Mm -hmm. Trust and believe the minute I hear about it, I'm letting everybody that I know through a vision path know like this conference is coming up. We got to go because I met yeah. a lot of black designers through that. I met people that I interviewed on the show there. I actually got some interviews while I was there. Like it was a great experience. That's what I'm talking about. I have to admit that that I just kind of swore off a lot of the design conferences because I just basically became resigned. <laughs> and I'm sure that there are people of color that are there, the designers that are there. I probably could have met, but I just was like, no, I said, I, I just... I'm not even dealing with that anymore. I do pay attention to what they're doing and what they're talking about, but that something like that, you know, is more up the alley of what I'm talking about, because then I'm not even saying, I don't even know what would come out of that. Even if I walked away, just feeling encouraged, that's a start. But some people might walk away, even brainstorming some other things. Like th there's one conference I just found out about from listening to one of your podcasts. You mentioned the guy, Marshall Shorts. I hadn't even known. My, my wife has roots in Ohio. I didn't even know about this conference. And I was looking at some of the pictures and stuff. And I said, either these folks are really fooling me or there's a lot of people of color here. <laughs> you know? And so they're on my radar now as a conference. Now, I know that it's not a conference for uh, designers of color. I understand that. But my point is that they don't seem to, at least from on the outside looking in, they don't seem. And I've sent a note to him about it. They don't seem to shy away from incorporating uh, designers of color. And I'm cool with that. I'm not even saying we have to run everything. You know, that's not even my point. My first point, first and foremost, is like you said, is just connecting, number one. And then number two, the depth of the connection will determine what happens after that. Yeah. To be honest with you, I don't, I'm not, some people aren't into like, I I don't want to plan anything. Okay, fine. Uh, some people just want, hey, can we Skype like once a month? Fine. You know, so there's different ways of going about it. And so I'm trying to figure that out right now because I want to I want to be able to grow also. Uh, I mean, I read, I do other things to grow, but I also want to make sure that I'm growing in other ways, too in ways that I might not see. And that generally comes from coming in contact with different types of people. Mm -hmm. And especially 
other black creatives, you know, because like I said, I listened to some of the podcasts and I was, I'm like, man, I would have never thought to put those two things together the way they explained that or the thing that they're involved in, you know, and, and I listened to other podcasts, too, from so I listened, I just finished listening to something with Michael Beirut. I listened to something with Debbie Mill. I listened to those people. They've given some good insights on clients and stuff like that. Like, I'll go, oh, yeah, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> yeah. Or, dang, I'm doing that right. Or at least what it looks like is right. You know, but I still, like you said, I'm careful about not trying to make them like some idol that I can put on my shelf or my desk and say, this is who I want to be like. No, I just want to be me. And if if being me means impacting people behind the scenes with no one seeing it, I'm comfortable with that. I'm not saying that, that has, that's the only type of impact. I'm just saying that I'm at a point in my life, even with my children, that I recognize that some things I wanted to achieve, I'm not going to be able to achieve. And a lot of it has to do with time, timing, and even being black. So it means that, okay, I got to make sure I set my kids up so they can achieve some of the things that I may not have been able to do. I wanted to go back and get a PhD, to be honest with you. But I just kind of looked at it. And I said this 10 years ago, but I said, if I go get a PhD, I'm going to be gone 10 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I might be gone when my kids hit that high school track. And I was like, I need to be available. You know, I came from a dysfunctional family and I'm just real clear about what's important to me with them. So I feel like you only get one shot at raising your kids. And yeah. so I make that a very important part. I wanted to make sure I didn't part of the reason I didn't go back, go back. Cause I said, I wouldn't be as available to them during that time. So I said, okay, fine. And I also, at my age, I just was like, I got to think about leverage in terms of, okay, if I went back and got a PhD, how many years am I really going to get to really make this work? Number one. And number two, I can't go back. I can't get any debt. I just, that would be what makes sense. I'd be paying mm. off debt when I'm 75, you know, so that I would have to go back and not inc incur a great deal of debt and whatever. And, you know, it, I'm not saying it's not possible, but right now I'm focused on their future and the future of a lot of the other kids that I'm trying to mentor. Right. Well, just to kind of, you know, wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work online? Well, I can be found on my website is propheticsoul.com. Prophetic is spelled with a K. Propheticsoul.com. That's where my website is in terms of my work and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Anybody, I'm generally on Facebook as well. I have a, a business page. I have a personal page. People can find me. If they want to send me a personal message on my personal page, they can. I, I can't remember my privacy settings allows them to put a message on my actual Facebook page, but they can find me in, in those places. I'm trying to do spread my writing out a little bit more. Like I'm trying to use medium now, like whatever I put on my blog, I'm trying to put on medium, but I'm trying to get in the habit of doing it. Cause then that's another thing I have to do. I try to do regular writing around design, whether it's social impact stuff, branding or things that I've learned mm -hmm. and whatever. So that's the primary places that you can find me. I'm not giving out my phone number. You're going to have to work for that. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I, I hear that. Ron Tinsley, thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate a lot of what you had to say about the social impact of design. I really like, you know, your business and how it's focused on nonprofits and about ways to give back to the community. And I also really appreciate that we kind of had this really candid talk about conferences and how this sort of stuff works because it's something that I think, you know, maybe a lot of people don't necessarily know. They might have had these thoughts themselves and not known that mm -hmm. this is what other people were thinking too. But I feel like you've you've really done good. You've done good. I don't know if anyone has told you that just in terms of the work that you've done, but the fact that you have raised your family and you're doing this work and you're still continually finding ways to give back to the community is something that is completely admirable. I want to, I respect you for doing that. Thank you for doing that. Well, thank you. And of course, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. No, I, I appreciate it too. And and thank you for the compliment, man. It, it really does mean a lot too that, that you mentioned family and that sort of thing. Cause that that's honestly, that's, that's a big priority for me, but at the same time that having them 
folks in the way they need to allows me to do some of the the mentoring that I do with other people. So and also be encouraged, man. There are people that are sweating you, Maurice, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like myself. You know, there are people out there listening to your podcast and that sort of thing. And I want to continue to encourage you to continue to grow, whatever that means for you. Please keep me connected to what you're doing in general. And I mean that on a personal level. OK, well, you know, I would appreciate that. Like when you because my guess is that you'll see stuff come past your desk before I will. Like I didn't know about the that Harvard conference, for instance, and some of these other things. And, and so please feel free to 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 let me know what you find out, what you're learning, because I, I, I do want to try to find a ways to be available for things like that. Absolutely. I will do. Thoughts of love are in And that's it for this week. Big thanks to Ron Tinsley and thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Ron and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Thanks as always to our sponsors, Facebook Design, MailChimp, and Hover. Facebook invests in design. They care deeply about how their design team might do their best work, and that manifests itself in a number of different ways, such as showing how internal design critiques work at Facebook, sharing resources about VR and other cutting edge tech, and by giving away great tools and resources like Origami Studio, popular device templates, and even diverse hands for mockups. Learn more about Facebook design at facebook.com forward slash design. More than 15 million businesses around the world use MailChimp to grow their businesses, recapture sales, and make money in their sleep. Did you know that you can now make Facebook ads inside MailChimp and connect them to your list? It's a real game changer for you marketers out there. Sign up for a free account today. MailChimp. Send better email. Hover takes all the hassle and confusion out of buying and managing your domain. With free private domain registration and your choice of domains across all the 400 plus domain extensions out there, how can you turn that down? Save 10% off your first purchase by using the promo code REVISIONPATH at checkout. This episode was edited by RJ Basilio and produced by me, Maurice Cherry. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. If you liked this episode, please do me a huge favor. Subscribe to us on iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. It only takes a minute or two. It really, really helps the show out by bumping us up in the iTunes rankings for design podcasts. And I'll even read your review right here on the show. Also, before you go, I've got one more favor. Like I said before, we're putting together a special episode this month to commemorate our fourth anniversary, and I want you to be a part of it. Send me a message or a voice note by February 24th and tell me what you think about the show. Tell me what you think about any of our past guests, whatever you'd like. I'll read or play your message during the episode, which will also have a special guest. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Visit us today at yepitslunch.com for all your design, strategy, and creative consulting needs. And if you like the work that we're doing here with Revision Path, then please consider becoming a patron. You know, now more than ever, Revision Path needs your support to make sure that stories about black designers and creatives are being told in our own words, really. So if you support us, just go to patreon.com forward slash revision path and pledge today. Pledge level started just $1 a month and you'll get access to behind the scenes information about the show, upcoming interviews, and so much more. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time. 